Uh, today is December 10th, 2020. Uh, we are at our third meeting. Today, we're going to continue our discussion on the capital project needs of the county. Um, we're going to start with a presentation with guest speakers from our public works um, on roadway infrastructure. Um, then also, um, there will be a, a presentation on facilities and going over some of the big projects happening in the county. Then we will hand it over to a call from our county executive's office to discuss various downtown Columbia capital projects. And also our friends from library system is going to discuss about their capital needs, uh, primarily for the downtown Columbia library. Uh, we already talked about virtual meeting logistics, so I'm not gonna go over that again today. Uh, just to remind everybody, um, please try to hold your questions until each speaker finish his or her own presentation. We block the time for Q&A for each speaker. Now with that, I will hand it over to Chris, who is the first speaker from our DPW. Um, can we make him the speaker and he can share his, um, his uh, PowerPoint? Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Sun. Can everybody see my screen OK? Yes. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Jagarapu. I'm a bureau chief for uh, Howard County, uh, work uh, in the uh, Department of Public Works. Uh, I want to give you a brief overview of our infrastructure needs, talk about our request for FY22 capital budgets, um, and uh, answer any questions that you may have as Chris, we speak. I'm sorry. Chris, yeah. I'm sorry. I think your WebEx meeting reminder is still on the screen. Are you able okay. to? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'll give you an overview about our um, infra infrastructure needs and answer any questions that you may have. So any, anything that you see when you drive along a roadway, whether, road, whether it's a road surface, um, if you see street trees, traffic signs, traffic signals, sidewalks, and stuff that you do not see along the roadway, uh, which includes some storm drain infrastructure that goes underneath the roadway, a lot of that stuff is maintained by uh, my bureau within public works. There are other things like water and sewer that is maintained by our Bureau of Utilities. We maintain all existing infrastructure and anything that is dedicated to the county as part of our subdivision um, process that gets transferred over to the county. I wanna focus on some of our key programs today uh, to talk about uh, some programs that uh, we use uh, more than others, like the road resurfacing program, the ADA ramp upgrade program, sidewalk repair program, street tree program, which mainly focuses on all uh, county street trees. And as many of you have heard in the past, the county has significant issues with uh, emerald ash borer uh, disease that has been killing a lot of uh, large existing trees. We're trying to get a hand on that by uh, removing those uh, hazardous trees and planting new trees along the uh, county right of ways. I'm also going to talk a little bit more about the storm drain repair program, which is a significant infrastructure that you typically do not see. When you see an issue, it is going to be a typically a bigger issue that needs to be addressed. We also have a traffic signalization program that we use to install any new traffic signals, repair and uh, upgrade existing traffic signals within the county. I'm not going to be talking about every program in detail today, but I'll give you an overview about uh, everything that we do. Uh, in terms of our road resurfacing program, the county maintains roughly about 3,650 roadways uh, that are county owned and maintained. There are other roadways that are maintained by State Highway Administration, like US 29, I-70, Route 32, 108, any roads that have numbers on them, they're maintained by State Highway. Besides State Highway, uh, any roadways that are uh, along that you drive on are county owned and maintained roadways. There are some private roadways within the county that are maintained by individual homeowners associations um, and not by the county. 
the total uh, mileage that we have uh, is roughly about 1,080 center lane miles of the roadway. Uh, in other words, it's uh, approximately 2,400 lane miles of road that the county maintains. Uh, just to give you a perspective of uh, what 2,400 lane miles is, it is from here to Sacramento, California. So if you were to drive from here to Sacramento, California, that's how much roadway that we have uh, that we maintain within Howard County. And in terms of the breakdown, about 80% of our roads are local roads where you have uh, residential frontage and 20% of our roadways are primary roadways about, um, just to give you an example, similar to Little Texan Parkway, Broken Lamp Parkway, Snowden Road Parkway, all of these roadways are primary roadways within the county that have multiple lanes uh, on these roadways. What we do and how we maintain these, uh, this our system is we inspect every roadway uh, in the county every two years. The last inspection that we did was in 2019. Why do we do this inspection? Uh, we do this inspection so we know how to handle and what type of repairs we need to make along these roadways and we get the biggest bang for the buck uh, that we spend. Uh, the roadways deteriorate uh, the typical age for a roadway is anywhere between uh, 20 to 30 years. Uh, it, there's multiple factors that affect the age of a roadway. Some roadways may last a little longer than 30 years. Some age roadways may last less than 20 years and closer to 15 years. But in general, what we try to do is we try to monitor the roadway condition and it, it gets assigned uh, an index or what we call a pavement condition index, which is a PCI number. It's a value that we give based on how the roadway is and depending on the PCI value, we make a decision on what type of uh, repair or preventative and preservation um, action that we need to take. Some actions cost less, some actions cost more. Uh, for example, if we do like any microsurfacing program, which is a thin, uh, thin, thin uh, material that we spread to seal the existing asphalt surface, it costs less, but it does not give any significant structural uh, strength to the roadway. However, it seals the roadway and extends the life of the roadway by five to seven years. Sometimes I mean, we get five years based on where we apply. Uh, if you apply it on roadways uh, that carry a lot of traffic, a lot of heavy traffic on those roadways, we may get slightly less than five years. We also do what we call a thin overlay, uh, which is a smaller uh, overlay along the roadways. Most of our uh, work typically is done on uh, structural overlay, which is a purpose program, where we take the top two inches of the roadway and reinstall that asphalt. So when you see a roadway that is, you're driving along a road and then it has some built surface, that is, um, that is what we remove. So we remove the top two inches of the roadway and then add the new surface on top of it. Reconstruction is a smaller portion. It costs a lot of money for us to reconstruct. Um, when we go into reconstruction, we basically have to go into removing more than the two inches of the roadway. Uh, typically, we try to avoid the situation as it costs a lot of money to rebuild an entire roadway rather than preserve what we have. So our goal is to preserve the pavement the way that we have it uh, and extend the life of the pavement. Uh, so average life, as I mentioned, um, is, is about 20 to 30 years. So we typically do not need any major repairs uh, prior to 15 years. Based on this life expectancy of a roadway and the number of miles that we maintain, uh, on an average, we need to repay approximately about 72 to uh, 71 to 72 miles each year. And it costs about $200,000 per lane mile for us to uh, repay. When we do that resurfacing, it equates to uh, 14 to $15 million each year. Our current average for the past uh, 10 years of funding uh, is about $5.6 million. This upcoming year, we are asking for $12.5 million, which is what we need to maintain the PCI level at the conditions that it is in now. We want to take a look at uh, the historical uh, allocations or appropriations to scaffold project. And the bars that you see at the bottom are the uh, approved um, monies in, uh, in millions of dollars. And uh, the blue line represents the pavement condition index. As you can see from 2003 to 2021, uh, the, the trend of the PCI 
follows slightly behind. So in other words, if, if funding for roadway is reduced, it takes a year for us to reflect to see like that those changes because payment will continue to deteriorate and then uh, the PCI value will go down. Even if we increase the funding, it does not take into effect immediately. It takes a little bit of lag before we realize the uh, change, in, uh, change in the PCI value. One, one thing that we did um, after our 2019, uh, earlier this year, uh, we collected the data late uh, last year in 2019, calendar year 2019. And in 2020, we went and evaluated different scenarios to see what existing backlog we have and how much money it would cost for us to do all the repairs, how much would it cost for us to maintain the existing PCI, and how much where would we be um, looking forward if we were only spending $5 million a year? If we continue to spend $5 million a year, our PCI value will continue to deteriorate and um, we are projecting that it would be at a PCI level of 72. Typically, we consider anything less than uh, 70 to be uh, in a poor condition or fair condition um, of the roadway where we have to do like a significant maintenance effort. Uh, if we go below that level, if we go to 2.5, or if no funds are provided, PCI is expected to drop down significantly to below uh, below 70, closer to 64, 65. Here's a quick sample of uh, uh, of the entire county. Uh, I don't expect you to uh, be able to read this map clearly, uh, but what I wanna what I wanna uh, say is anything that you see in darker green has a PCI value that rates it as an in good condition. Anything that you see in lighter green or yellow, or if you see red, the yellow and red are the roadways that we have to maintain. You may say, like, I see a lot of uh, dark green here, especially in the western part of the county. When we do the pavement condition uh, index evaluation, uh, a lot of roadways are looked at based on the surface. We do look at the subsurface at some other locations to determine to see uh, what the condition is. A lot of roadways in the western part of the county are uh, chip sealed. Uh, when, when you look at the overall top surface on these roadways, it may look like that the roadway is uh, perfectly fine, which in, in, in most cases it is, uh, but there are situations where we have to go back and do some patchwork to bring it back up to, up to par. One of the other challenges that we have, especially when we don't get the funding to the level that we need, is when we go into a neighborhood, typically we would like to um, complete resurfacing or treatment in the entire neighborhood. If you pay attention to the neighborhood in the middle here that has the darker green line, this is a representation of what we would like to typically do. When we go into a neighborhood, we do the entire neighborhood, all the streets within that neighborhood, rather than doing one or two roadways and then walk away. If you look at the neighborhood that is to the left of the, on the left side of the screen or the right side of the screen, where you see some yellows, some reds, some light greens, that is a neighborhood that requires resurfacing now. When we go into that neighborhood, we prefer to do the entire neighborhood rather than pick the roadways that are only in red portion, only in yellow portion. Um, so operationally, it makes more sense for us to mobilize a crew into that one area, finish that entire neighborhood, and then move to an, another neighborhood rather than bounce between different portions of the county so that we get more efficiency from our uh, contractors and we pay less money for our mobilization costs. So this is this is this is one uh, one portion that I do want to uh, bring it to your attention. Last year, our funding level uh, was one point five million dollars, and when we have one point five million dollars, I would not be able to go and resurface an entire neighborhood. If we did, it would only last for that one neighborhood and not be able to go to other other locations within the county where we have to do some uh, preservation efforts. The other program that I want to talk to you about is a sidewalk repair program. Uh, the county has roughly uh, about 900 miles of sidewalk. As many of you may know, uh, the, the county uh, code section 18402, which discusses the responsibility of the maintenance of sidewalk. In general, the sidewalk maintenance is on the adjacent property owner. It's not on the county unless the damage to a sidewalk is caused by a street fee or a county utility. We get requests from citizens about poor sidewalk conditions and we evaluate those locations to see if they're county's responsibility or adjacent property owner's responsibility. 
when we get the request, we typically add it to our uh, list. Uh, right now, we have a backlog of more than a million dollars in uh, in that list for us to make the repairs. In fiscal year 22, we're requesting funding for a million dollars to catch up to this uh, backlog. Some other requests that we have are over four years old, uh, and and these are these are requests where you know citizens are walking along the roadway. Uh, and these are safety hazards for the county too, and they are liability issues. Some of these pictures that I'm showing you are not just the bad conditions or the worst conditions. These are typical conditions in the complaints that we normally receive. A lot of these locations where we have established neighborhoods with large trees, the trees uproot the sidewalks and uh, have some concern. In the last year and a half or so, in order to stretch the dollars that we have, we have started to cut the concrete especially if the uh, elevation difference is less than two inches because the sidewalk thickness is about four inches uh, thick. So we can't cut the concrete for anything more than two inches. So we try to like, you know, go to these locations and cut the concrete so that at least the tripping hazard is eliminated. Some other residents call back, they complain that the uh, color of the concrete, uh, existing concrete, and then the where we cut the concrete is not matched and it's a, an eyesore especially adjacent to some nicely maintained uh, manicured lawns. Uh, it may look a little bit different, but at least the hazard is not there. The picture to the bottom left, I want you to focus on that. Um, it is something like where we would up approach uh, adjacent property owners. That is not the repairs that the county made. It is the repairs that an adjacent property owner made. Yes, they've replaced some of the adjacent blocks uh, that were uh, damaged uh, and they installed them. Some of the homeowners associations or organizations that are adjacent to some of the existing sidewalks, they may be able to make repairs. But this past year, I have received many homeowners associations saying that they don't have adequate funds. They're going to prioritize the repairs for future years. But at the current condition, they're not able to make the repairs. So this is something that we need to um, we need to keep an eye on. And we are um, we keep sending letters to the adjacent property owners if it is their responsibility to make them aware of uh, what their liability concerns are. One of the other uh, program, um, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, unless you unless there is an issue, uh, you don't want to see like a storm drain uh, culvert that is running underneath the roadway. County has over 700 miles of a storm drain pipe of various dimensions uh, that is in that is that is in our system that we are aware of. Uh, there are some locations that we're still trying to uh, find and add uh, when we go out to look at a location. Uh, it is not in our system, but we try to add it to our system. We currently have about 45 of active projects where there is a concern that was reported to the county. And when we go there, we do an inspection of that system to see like, what is causing the uh, damage and what type of repairs do we need to make at those locations. So roughly to make repairs to these 45 locations, it our, our estimate at this point is um, $5 million. These are these are active locations. What I uh, am gonna do is I'm gonna show you some of these sample locations as these are not the locations that you typically do see. Uh, when we do an inspection, the picture on the left and the picture on the right is a video pipe inspection. We use a camera to drive through the um, storm rain culverts. A good pipe should look something like, you know, either one of these photos that you see on your screen either the one on the left or on the right. One of the locations where we received a concern, it was actually a concern uh, not specifically about this location, but we received a concern pretty close to this area. And when we looked at that area, we noticed that the uh, storm drain culverts were deteriorated. So we decided to look at a couple more locations adjacent to it. Here's the location on uh, Tamar Drive. Uh, you see two inlets at the bottom of your screen. Um, with a storm drain pipe running underneath the roadway. And the location with the X mark is the location where this picture, uh, so this is what it looks like underneath the roadway. So this is not what you'd normally see, but that's the condition of the pipe that we, we have underneath the roadway. It is a significant uh, concern to us uh, for us to make repairs. The pipe uh, is completely damaged and we need to remove and replace that pipe um, altogether. Another location that I want to give you a sample uh, is off of Old Washington Road in Elkridge, S2 Me Lane. It, the entire neighborhood has about uh, roughly uh, over 100 uh, residential homes. 
um, and it's an only access to come onto Old Washington Road. It's a significant network within the community where the pink lines and the purple lines that you see on the map here, uh, all these lines represent a storm drain pipe. Uh, there are several locations, as you notice at the top of the screen, where it is crossing the roadway at uh, multiple locations along Tumi Lane, crossing multiple driveways, crossing uh, uh, storm drain pipe going adjacent to uh, residential homes and in and, and some backyards. So when we received a concern about uh, one of the locations in, in this neighborhood, and when we went and looked at it, here's a location on Tumi Lane uh, as you're approaching from Old Washington, one of the locations that I want to share with you today. So it's a storm drain pipe that is going in between the two inlets. And this pipe should really, leak. it's a, a HDPE pipe, a, a plastic pipe. Uh, and as you can see, the pipe should really look uh, straight as I showed you in the pictures earlier. Uh, so there are depressions within the pipe. There are some sags. All these white lines that you see on these pictures, it is some kind of a fracture. So this pipe is failing or it's already failed and it requires us to remove and replace this pipe. And there is significant uh, amount of uh, pipe that is driving along the roadway uh, it is going to be a, a major effort for us to uh, make repairs within the community another example that i want to share with you is alexander bell drive in the columbia gateway uh, columbia gateway was built uh, many years ago as you know like most of columbia was built uh, uh, in, a, in a very uh, quick fashion and a significant amount of roadway was built so all the infrastructure is deteriorating at the same pace so Here's another location um, on Alexander Bell Drive, uh, two inlets that you see in the picture, storm drain culvert running underneath the roadway, and that is the condition of the storm drain uh, pipe. Granted, if you notice all the way to the bottom of the screen, there is a directional bore conduit that was installed, and the blue line that you see uh, at the bottom of the screen, uh, blue or teal color uh, pipe that is running uh, at the bottom, that has caused some damage to the pipe, but the pipe itself is also deteriorating. And when, when we looked at the rest of the system, there are multiple locations in Columbia Gateway that require our immediate attention. Another location that I want to share with you is uh, in the same neighborhood as uh, Tumi Lane, Joseph Scott Drive. Uh, here's a storm drain culvert that is going from the roadway towards the back of the uh, back of the outfall. And this pipe is significantly deep. It's, it's about 15 to 20 feet below ground. And that's the condition of the pipe. The pipe is, is failing, as you can see on the left side of the picture. Um, there are some white lines. It looks like the pipe is getting pushed from one end. That pipe is uh, about to uh, fail. And when you take a closer look at some of these white lines, as I mentioned before, each of those uh, white lines is a crack. So here's a closer picture of uh, of that uh, pipe. So again, uh, as I mentioned, this is this is how a normal pipe should look like. A good pipe should look like. I'm not saying that you know all of the pipes that we inspect is a bad pipe. It's a lot of pipe that we find that is a good pipe. And uh, just to give you an approximate uh, approximate numbers, I was talking to my staff. We probably inspected about one percent of uh, our storm drain system. And stuff that we are finding now um, is is based on uh, reactive, uh, reactive uh, method from citizen concerns, not doing that proactively. So when we go and do the inspection, uh, we we come across some strange things. Uh, it's not all uh, bad pipe that we always find. I mean, you know, sometimes we come across stuff like our friends trying to uh, go through a storm drain pipe. I do want to talk about, uh, we use the same program with Ben Morgan Road. Uh, there's existing road culverts that are going underneath. There's a couple locations on Wood Ben Morgan Road that we worked on uh, recently, uh, the past couple months. Uh, culverts that were going underneath the roadway were failing, uh, and they had pretty low cover on top of the pipe, pretty shallow pipes. We looked at, looked at these locations, worked with the MDE to get the permits to replace these culverts. Typically, we replace the culverts in the same shape or same kind, but in this case, we determined that the culverts in a uh, uh, corrugated metal pipe is not an appropriate design. So MDE allowed us to move forward and install a, a box culvert. 
and this is something that we just finished in uh, October. So one of the reason why I want to bring some of these things uh, to your attention is there is a need for us to do uh, an asset management for all the assets that we maintain. As I mentioned, we only looked at 1% of our road, uh, storm drain system. And we're finding so many of the issues within the 1% of our review. There are many problems out there that I do not know about. Uh, granted, like we cannot uh, prioritize and program all these repairs uh, in, in any one given year, but it would be good for us to know where the problems are so that we can plan and uh, make, make uh, appropriate recommendations and repairs. In conclusion, what I would want to say is uh, we are requesting for all the programs that uh, Bureau of Highways manages, uh, roughly about $23 million is our request. Uh, if you look at the capital budgets and, and look at the capital programs that we, uh, we manage, these are programs that typically do not have any prior appropriations remaining at the end of the fiscal year. We typically spend all the money that we receive I want to draw your attention to the bottom of the screen where the numbers are highlighted and the trend that we're looking at in the last three years. In fiscal year 2019, we received a little over $10 million for all of our programs combined. And in fiscal year 20, we received $7.7 .7 million. And in fiscal year 21, we received $3.85 million for all of our programs combined. The $3.85 million is about 50% less than the fiscal year 20, about 63% less than fiscal year 19. Uh, if we continue to go with this trend, it would be extremely, extremely difficult. And, and I can even say uh, near impossible for us to do what we need to do and maintain the system in a good condition. I want to thank you for uh, your uh, help and support. Uh, in giving us the giving us the funding that we need to keep the roadway safe in Howard County, and uh, I would entertain any questions that you uh, have at this point. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Anybody you. Uh, has questions? We are open to that. And just make sure unmute yourself when you ask questions. Yeah. Hey, Chris. This is Craig. Um, great. Right. Um, it's not so much a question, but it might be helpful for the committee to get an understanding of the funding sources, because obviously we've got some PAYGO and I believe we'll have some bonds in there as well. And if you want to touch on that a little bit. Good question. Um, I can I can speak a little bit and Dr. Sun, please chime in if you want to um, as well. Most of our resurfacing work is typically done as uh, PAYGO funding. Uh, that has been uh, historically uh, that has been our funding source for resurfacing type of work. Anytime we make any improvements that require that have uh, a lifespan of more than 20 years or 30 years, for example, our storm drain uh, repair program, typically we use bond funding for sidewalk uh, storm drain repair program. When we do any small improvements, when we do resurfacing program, our historically it has been uh, PAYGO funding. Uh, some of the other jurisdictions have been looking at uh, the same concerns that Howard County is having, and they have been looking at uh, other other ways of uh, funding, whether it's bond funding or whether it's PAYGO funding for some of our programs. Does that answer your question, Craig? Um, yeah, I just, like I said, I thought it might be helpful because, you know, the um, the committee is going to be making recommendations on the bond funding and operating costs, but there's also PAYGO, like you said, involved in the actual road resurfacing and so forth. So, yeah, I think that was important. Yeah, a good question, uh, Craig. And and as Chris just mentioned, that it's a blend of different sources there for the road resurfacing part because of the life uh, for the type of work um, put on there. A lot of these are less preventative type of work, it's more, um, you know, kind of patching and try to maintain that. It usually doesn't last for a long period of time, like 20 years or longer. So uh, it's not qualified for bonds. So typically we're using cash pay-go. And as Chris has been pointed out in his uh, presentation, due to the funding constraints last uh, several years, uh, the budget allocation for those type of work really hasn't been keeping up with the needs 
as a result, the PCI or the road index kind of illustrated that it has shown, unfortunately, a decline trend. Um, and one question actually, of course, is that your slide shows also a different funding with the potential implication for the PCI going forward, right? I think you mentioned that if, if keep the funding at close to 5 million or lower per year, then that trend is going to continue and actually quickly decline further in the next several years. So what do you have an estimate? What will be the, the minimum amount to keep your condition, PCI, even just maintain at the current level, not even improving? Do you have an estimate for that? Well, I think I think the current level um, for us to maintain um, is, is to uh, fund approximately 10 to $12 million each year. Uh, that would be that would be for us to maintain. Uh, any roadway that we have within the county. Uh, the, as I mentioned before, average age of uh, a roadway and approximate miles that we have within the county, if you look at look at that breakdown, um, typically, like, you know, we, we need to spend 10 to $12 million each year. Thank you. Holly, this is Joan Dreesen. I was just wondering, um, Chris, if, as you do sidewalk repairs, do you prioritize in any way neighborhoods where there are people with disabilities or their senior developments? Is that a it's consideration? A great, it's a great question. Um, unfortunately, you know, uh, it is. We, we try to we, we try to go uh, by the by the request that we receive. But what we try to do is, I mean, like for operational purposes, when we are in a neighborhood, we try to like you know look at neighborhood by neighborhood rather than go from uh, by the date that it was reported. We do look at, uh, we do look at like, you know, the older older requests to make sure that they are included uh, as we try to uh, make repairs. But oftentimes what we do, as I mentioned in my presentation, like in our backlog is such a significant backlog at this point, we have uh, issues that were reported three, four years ago, and we go and add it to our list, and then we go back to make the repairs prior to issuing the work to the contractor. We re-inspect that area to see, you know, hey, has anything changed? Oftentimes, you know, we end up instead of replacing two blocks or three blocks, we end up replacing four or five blocks. And by doing so, we also look at, uh, you know, the entire street. For example, if, if a concern was reported on, I'm on Riverwood Drive here uh, in Columbia, and if a concern was on Riverwood Drive, we don't go to that specific address and just look at that address. We go to that entire street and fix anything that is within the street. To answer your question, um, we we don't try to look at uh, uh, neighborhoods that have uh, the you know aging population or, or or less aging population as a criteria, uh, but we do look at uh, the repairs that are needed within a neighborhood and fix the entire neighborhood and walk away. Sometimes we get requests um, while we are in that neighborhood, and then like you know, those get addressed. Uh, not to say that those are not important, but then if you're already there, a contract is already working there, a concrete truck is already coming to that neighborhood, it's much easier for us to fix it while we're there rather than like, go to a different neighborhood and come back to the same neighborhood um, all over again. So we try to go like from one end of the county to the other end of the county. Um, we try to work, work our way through um, and, and prioritize our locations that way. Okay, but, but not by population per se. That is correct. Okay, thank you. I have Barbara a has a question. I think you are unmuted already. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, what my question is is in the straight uh, drain, the storm drain management. How much of that deterioration causes destabilization of the roadway system? I mean, do we have a duplicate problem there? It 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 it, it is. I mean, it's, it's actually a really good question. Um, I, I I wanted to talk about it. I'm glad you actually asked the question. So typically, when we do a resurfacing work, we go and inspect all the features. We resurface a particular roadway. We check all the storm drains underneath the roadway so that we are not just putting a new asphalt surface on top, only to go back and have to dig it uh, open to fix a storm drain pipe. So we look at curbs, we look at sidewalks, we look at ramps, we look at storm drains, we look at all the features. And most cases, we try to address them prior to us resurfacing a roadway. Sometimes we delay a road resurfacing project because we have to fix other things in the roadway prior to us going back. Uh, we 
when I say it, you know, most times I mean, we make a significant effort to not uh, repave and then go back to damage those roadways. There are other utilities within the county right away. Sometimes we uh, get lucky, sometimes we don't. Uh, we resurface the roadway and BGU might decide that they're going to come back to do repair a, a broken uh, gas main uh, that you know that seemed okay initially when we were resurfacing the roadway, but a year later, like you know, there's a water main break or a gas main break that somebody else has to go in and make repairs. Uh, we do coordinate with other departments within the county uh, to uh, make sure that there's no other capital projects, no other utility work that happens prior to us uh, picking a roadway. So there's a significant amount of uh, work that happens in the background before we pick a roadway or a neighborhood for us to resurface um, a location. And a kind of a follow up on that, what's our liability? Like if you're cutting across property, a kind of a property line for people in a neighborhood, I mean, not the roads aside, I mean, what's our liability to homeowners if, if there's a strain door um, collapse? Um, so storm drain pipes that run through private properties, county has easements. So we will have a, a, a 20 foot easement uh, where our storm rain pipe is. And we actually go into those locations. If there's any damages that we cause to the adjacent property owner, then we, we would be liable to fix those, those locations within the easement area. So we have the right to go make repairs, but typically when we go back and make the repairs, we try to put it back in the same condition that the area is prior to us going in to do the repairs. Thank you. Sometimes property owners would install fences within the easement. That is not, that is a no-no. Uh, so those locations, we remove the fence. We don't put the fence back for them. They have to come back and put the fence on their own. Uh, I have a question, Todd Arterburn here. So uh, I, I, just some back of the envelope calculations. The last three years you've requested roughly 63 million. Um, you stated that roughly 36 million would have kept the PCI level those three years. And if I read them right, roughly $23 million has been funded. So what would have $63 million done the PCI and what has $23 million actually resulted in with respect to the PCI rating? Yes, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, the 63 million that you're talking about or the 23 million dollars per year that we're requesting is not necessarily all for resurfacing program. It is for the, our storm drain program. It is for uh, ADA ramp repair, street tree program, sidewalk repair program. All of the projects that Bureau of Highways manages combined together is 23 million dollars. Our request for resurfacing is 12.5 million dollars. So each year, if you get $12.5 million, 10 to $12 million, we'd be able to maintain our PCI at the level that it is in now. Uh, but if we, each year that we do not submit, uh, we do not uh, allocate funds at that level, the PCI continues to decline. So if we stay with the $5 million PC, uh, $5 million per year for resurfacing now, by 2025, the PCI value would be at 72. It's currently at like you know, 76, 78, uh, but it'll continue to deteriorate each year. And even though we're putting money into it, it's not to the level that we need to maintain the existing PCI number. So roads will continue to deteriorate uh, every year that we don't do some kind of treatment on them. Uh, they don't, unfortunately, they don't get fixed on their own. Uh, and local roads, may have a little longer uh, longer life and uh, because of the amount of traffic that it has uh, the heaviest truck that you may have on a local road is a garbage truck that will go on it or some other delivery trucks that might go on it uh, but when you look at any of our collector roads or primary roads they may have larger uh, truck traffic on them and the deterioration on those roadways might be a lot a lot, lot faster than on some other local roadways so, Alan, uh, you have a question. Uh, let's make it this last one because we have three other speakers. Alan, you're you're on. Alan, you're uh, you are muted. Uh, try one more time. Um, 
we cannot hear you clearly. Maybe try this, turn off your uh, video, and sometimes broadband transition could be issue. Maybe just focus on voice, try that. Uh, a little bit. Can I, sorry, I still cannot hear clear. Maybe put your the question in the chat. Maybe, yeah, if you can use the chat box, we will read it for you. Uh, you can, are you able to type at the chat box? Okay, thank you. So while Ellen is uh, ty typing her question, we can maybe try one more person. If anybody else has a question, you can use the opportunity to ask quickly. Dr. Sun, I have a question. It's Go ahead. So uh, Chris, my question is, is, I see the problem can be very serious. There's so many underlying pipes and uh, underground pipes. Is there any of the development that goes on and goes on? Are we going to reconfigure the pipeline and routes in the future or when we do some repairs? No, I think for that as well? Well, we, 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 look at, we look at modifying the existing drainage. I mean, if most of these pipes were installed as part of a subdivision um, when, when, when they got built, uh, whether it's a roadway, uh, culverts underneath the roadway or through a subdivision. And some of our older neighborhoods will, um, all these culverts and storm drains would lead to a, a, an existing uh, water feature. So they may go to a storm drain pond uh, before they go into, uh, into a, uh, an existing water body. Uh, so we don't try to reconfigure unless there's a need. And if there's any issues with the existing system that we have to reconfigure, we try to reconfigure. Uh, sometimes it is the best way that uh, we have, but you know, we, do, we do, uh, do look at that uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I just got a question from Ellen. Uh, she was asking uh, or asked for confirmation from Chris that isn't it that a logical extension of uh, this is that more roads will need reconstruction at twice the cost of like the patching uh, or other fixing work? Is that true? That is, that, that, that is true. Um, so a resurfacing is, uh, if you think about it, like, you know, if we do not resurface a roadway, uh, there will be sub-base failures uh, stuck underneath the roadway that continues to deteriorate and other pro other problems that will require us to go back. Uh, I do remember, I think a couple of years ago, we actually were in a neighborhood where we were trying to resurface uh, a roadway. Once we milled the road, uh, the road started to fail. So we, you know, there was no, no option at that point for us to uh, turn away. We had to continue to rebuild that road Take everything from that sub base and build build the uh, build the road. Um, instead of being in the neighborhood for a week, we actually ended up spending uh, almost a month, a little over a month, for us to rebuild that roadway. Because when you think about a road, roadway, think about you know your house where your driveways meet a, a county public roadway. If we were put we were to put the road out of service for a month, that would have significant impact on some of the work that you do. So it's not just a cost. Um, Cost uh, impact, it would be uh, operational impact for all the residents that live along that roadway too. But that, Thank but you, to answer the question, uh, it would be uh, at, at least the twice the cost of uh, resurfacing work. Thank you, Chris, and also thank you for a great question from the committee. Uh, it's this very important subject and and, and really uh, very informative. We have to move on though, um, and so the next speaker is uh, Mark. Mark, uh, can uh, can the host allow Mark to to share his presentation? Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> All right, thanks, Holly. Um, Chris set a pretty high bar with sharing his presentation as far as uh, so hopefully I can uh, do as well. But we'll see here in a second. So does that work? See my screen. Uh, I was not able to see it. Um, hang on, hang on a second. Okay. Yeah, it works. Thank you. All right, great. Um, 
So um, thanks, thank you all for um, getting up early to uh, hear about our important concerns. Um, my name's Mark Stromdahl. I'm uh, an, an architect and chief of the Bureau of Facilities. Um, and facilities is involved in you know, quite a substantial number of capital projects, but we're only going to talk about three today that are particularly important to us. Um, and the first one, um, get to start off with something fun and exciting and interesting, which is uh, the East Columbia 50 Plus Center. So this project um, uh, is just adjacent to East Columbia Library. You'll see that in some of the other slides. Uh, projects about it's a little shy of 30,000 square feet in area. It's actually on two levels, and it's um, it uh, it's built into a hillside. So there's a, a level below this that, that opens out uh, on the other side of the building. Um, it's intended to be a lead gold building, um, so designed very efficiently. And you can see there are some solar panels that are going to be on the roof. Um, uh, the current uh, the current 50 plus center is about 4,200 square feet. It's very small and um, it gets a tremendous amount of use um, and it's woefully inadequate for, um, for the activities that, um, that it's intended to provide for. So, um, uh, so this represents a substantial expansion and improvement and um, you know, it's been a project of co community concern for a good number of years, and this project, as you can imagine, has very strong community backing. Um, uh, and the form of this um, uh, is kind of a, well, I guess there's a strong theme um, given Lee Gold and with the project stepping into the hillside, it's a naturalistic theme, and so the, the project itself um, I guess it's a metaphor for sort of a natural object, uh, and it also echoes the form of the East Columbia Library. So, so this is just the existing site. Um, you can see that's East Columbia Library, so the site for our project is right over here. Um, it's the site plan. So this white outline, that's the library we were just looking at. And this little piece of the building, that's the current um, 50 plus center. So um, this is just the upper level of the of the new facility. So you can get a sense there that it's a substantial, substantial increase in area and um, uh, which much stronger ability to provide for the needs um, of the residents that, that participate in the programs. So this first level, um, uh, which is on the same, more or less, more or less, uh, same elevation as the uh, as the library building. Um, it's the main entrance. Um, uh, they have offices up here, programs on one side of this, and then the key feature of the building is this large multi-purpose room, which can be opened up to be one space, or can uh, there are dividers so that these spaces can be divided and accommodate a, a broad range of activities. Um, and then the lower level, um, uh, that space becomes underneath this fitness room, exercise room, some classrooms, arts and crafts. And this is a this is a very compelling slide. It shows um, this is the main entrance level on the same level, basically as the library, and then the building is essentially built into this hillside, and so. Um, both levels look out, you know, into the trees and um, the natural scenery on the back side. And these slides just show some of the building materials, metal panels and masonry, um, similar theme. And then a couple of uh, couple of renderings of the inside. This is the upper lobby that you would see when you first come in. This is just a piece of the reception desk that would be greeting you. And then um, lower level, you know, looking out into the natural scenery beyond, you know, those are the stairs coming from the upper level and the elevators here. So, um, um, so it's a, you know, it's, let me go back, this, 
it's a fun project. It's an exciting project, uh, well embraced by the community. Um, the cost of this building is in the range of $20 million, um, and we have some funding authority already, but um, last year the council didn't vote to provide all the funds that were requested, so we didn't start construction this year. Um, so our request is just that this be fully funded um, um, so that we can start construction. Everything is pretty much have permits in hand, so we're ready to go, um, ready to bid the project as, as soon as we have the funds. So the next project I want to talk about is the detention center. Um, I know we discussed this uh, with you all last year. Um, the building is, uh, you know, 40 plus years old. Um, and so some systems and building fabric has been in a pretty deteriorated condition. We have put quite a bit of work into this over the last few years um, and actually upgraded it to the point to where um, uh, we pretty much are compliant, you know, fully compliant with state and federal standards. And um, uh, but I just have some some images of some of the work we've been doing. So one critical need was an improved medical suite. Um, um, and these are some photographs of this medical suite that's being enlarged um, and renovated um, to, well, to serve appropriate needs and um, provide for adequate, adequate suicide watch. Um, so this medical day space, um, this is a new space and you're looking at the doors of, of cells, holding cells for uh, uh, inmates who are um, down in the medical suite receiving treatment. And so uh, this is set up so um, a person in the space can look into all these cells. Um, and one of these is suicide watch cell and requires 24-7 you know, monitoring. I remember I showed some roof pictures last year, just a couple of pictures of uh, deteriorated conditions at the roof of the detention center. Um, and, and sorry, these are a little fuzzy, but here we're actually loading new, roof, new roofing materials. Um, and this, again, kind of fuzzy, but this is a picture of the new roof just before it was fully completed. So um, we've put a, we've completed this new roof project now and, you know, stopped the roof leaks that were occurring. So just a shot of, uh, you know, an existing wall. Uh, this is another fabric, another building fabric project we're going to be undertaking. We're going to be asking for money for this for FY22. Um, you can see the wall is, uh, these walls are, are masonry units, um, concrete masonry units, and the joints in many locations are deteriorating, and there's uh, water infiltration into these walls. So one of the projects is to, essentially seal these and then use metal panels to create what's called a, a rain screen, um, sheath a portion of the building where these are deteriorated with metal facing to, to you know, protect the building from the weather. And this is a list of, a uh, partial list of some of the critical projects we're involved in. Um, um, we started this window replacement um, the roof replacement is done, um, medical suite modification. I showed you some slides of that. Um, upgrading the CCTV and upgrading these door controls, um, those are in process. And when we're complete, when those are completed, we'll have substantially increased the uh, uh, security uh, capabilities of, of the existing detention center. So, um, uh, so as I say, we've done enough work here uh, that we really have the building, we're getting the building into pretty decent shape. So um, in this, for FY22, um, we anticipate uh, an approximate request of about $4 million, and of that, um, uh, capital maintenance issues uh, will be, say, around $500,000, and we think we've done enough work on major systems that, um, after this year, perhaps the next year, um, we actually anticipate having to do fewer major projects there, although we'll still have uh, capital maintenance, but um, 
based on what we know right now, we actually anticipate smaller uh, capital requests in outgoing years. So systemic maintenance, um, that is the last uh, major project I wanted to discuss with you all. Um, just a few images of the kind of work we do with the money that's in our systemic budget. Um, uh, we do infrastructure upgrades and also, you know, different kind of space and building modifications that are not large enough to really uh, stand alone as a capital project. So this was some work that was being done at the Bain 50 Plus Center. Um, this project is complete. Um, um, and just a few shots of sort of more infrastructure related projects. Um, uh, some mechanical equipment replacement at these various sites. Um, this is a partial list of the projects that we have ongoing in C0317. Um, um, but actually, in speaking of North Columbia, or East Columbia, excuse me, um, the library there adjacent to the uh, proposed 50 plus center, we're actually gonna be, it's time to re-roof that project. We plan on re-roofing that this year. Um, it may wind up with solar panels uh, on top of that once we get done with the roofing. Um, Glenwood fire pumps, critical infrastructure project. We've been doing quite a bit of work at the Long Reach Village upgrading uh, that facility. Um, we actually finished the police relocation into the lease space at the Oracle building. Um, and then we always have a fair number of projects uh, that we're working with recreation parks on. So, um, you know, we anticipate pretty well spending down the balance that we have right now in C0317. Um, our projections are we may end the year with about $800,000 in that project, but we always try to maintain at least a half a million dollar contingency, um, which, you know, is part of the projected projected money um, because we never know. I mean, a lot of the projects we do with systemic money, we don't know the, about those ahead of time. So we need to maintain a, a substantial contingency. Um, and that money would then be rolled over into a new systemic project we want to start. Um, um, and of the money that we're spending this year in C0317, about a million dollars of that is going to uh, our uh, capital maintenance program, which I'll get to that further in the presentation. So we're starting a new systemic project. It's just kind of a housekeeping issue. Um, uh, C0317 has been around a long time and um, the amount of money that has been put in it over the years, I mean, it just gets to be sort of large and cumbersome um, when we're dealing with it in the budget book. So we're going to close Caesar 317 out after the end of FY22, and we're starting with this new project, Caesar 365, but essentially they're the same project. Um, and so going forward, these are some projects that will be uh, the funding that we'll be requesting for FY22, these are some of the projects that we would be, um, we would be intending to work on um, with that money. So um, we anticipate a budget request of about $5 million in this project. Um, and, and going forward, we are, going to try to um, increase the amount that we're committing to capital maintenance every year. Um, so we're looking at about a million for FY21, trying to get money, say, for $2 million worth in uh, FY22. And then um, uh, we figure if we can if we can get our requests in outgoing years up to four to $5 million, then uh, by 2030, which is sort of the time frame in which our current capital maintenance program, that's the projected end, end for it, and we would actually be able to catch up and, uh, and 
complete all the capital maintenance projects that we have currently listed. So, um, and that does bring me to the capital maintenance program. Um, and we showed a slide that was similar to this last year. So, we have uh, over the over the last say five to six years, um, we have done a substantial inventory of. Uh, uh, all of our major assets as far as buildings go and um, and we have a, a good handle not a perfect handle but a good handle on on the improvements that need to be made so um, um, and this is not a this this program I mean it's not locked in stone um, as we complete projects of course um, they come out of this um, database and we also, you know, discover things that we were not aware of or that our engineers weren't aware of when they put this uh, put this database together. Um, and so we add projects to this as it goes along. So uh, this is fluid, but we have managed to knock off several million from this since we since we initiated um, this program. Um, and so you can see, uh, uh, you know, we haven't we have not managed to do all the work from previous years, and that's why it's still listed there. Um, you can see the grand total up here in the this red box is about 42 million right now. Um, so what our intention to propose is, as I was saying, um, uh, you know, we would be um, trying to increase this from you know one million to two million up to uh, say you know four to five million a year um, to where we would essentially by the end of uh, 2030 be able to have completed everything that we're aware of right now um, and it'll be more fluid than that because we will um, the buildings will continue to age and we'll continue to discover new things but if we were able to accomplish this um, um, you know we go a long way towards um, really having you know all the county's major facilities in in good operating condition. Um, so uh, appreciate everybody's attention, and um, we'll be happy to entertain questions. Uh, I I do have a question. Um, so by by my calculations, this. The price per square foot on the East Columbia Center is coming in at about five hundred and thirty dollars a foot. Um, if if you had to um, reduce the cost by twenty or twenty five percent, would you choose to reduce square footage or to reduce the cost per square foot by um, cutting down on the grandiosity of the project? Well, just a couple comments. So be aware that uh, that $20 million is the entire project cost. So it's not just a construction cost. Um, uh, the construction cost, I think, is like 17.5, something like that. So the 20 million includes consulting fees, it includes uh, FF&E. Um, um, I mean, just anyway, just to put that number in perspective. And we actually did, to, to get anywhere near the um, cost reduction you're talking about, we would have to reduce the building very substantially. Um, there's no way you can, um, you can't cut enough sort of fluff, if you want to call it that, or um, enough, um, I don't know, uh, excess out of a project to uh, to get it down 25% without reducing the square footage. We in my experience, um, generally, you can maybe get to 10% um, by by doing that. However, in this project, um, you know, being aware and concerned about the cost, a lot of that, uh, there have been a lot of reductions while the building was being designed. And last year, we did cut not a huge amount, but even before we got into the budget process, we we looked at the numbers and cut it, you know, at least uh, a thousand square feet or so out of the project. So it's um, um, so it would be to to reduce it by that amount would it would just take substantial, you know, really substantial redesign. So.
Um, Thank you, I Mark. Have, Any other questions, oh, Barbara? Yes, I have a question. Um, going back to the detention center, the water infiltration in the walls, is there any indication that we have a mold problem because of that? No, no. It's uh, um, a lot of those areas, I mean, we've treated temporarily with, you know, the ceiling joints. Um, uh, and so, no, we, and we're in there a lot. Um, and uh, so we are not having a mold problem due to that, but that's a good question and a good concern, so. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, if no more questions, thank you very much, Mark. Um, our next speaker is uh, Carl DeLorenzo. Carl, are you on? Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, sound check. Okay, Holly? Yes. You can hear me okay? Great. Yeah. And would you uh, like me to share my screen to uh, yes, put my PowerPoint? Okay. <laughs> thank you. Great. So Holly, with, uh, I'll begin, if that works for you? Yes, go ahead, thank you. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Carl DiLorenzo. I'm the uh, policy director uh, within the county executive's office. And I am here to present this morning um, on a dedicated revenue stream that's relatively new to the county. Um, and I, and uh, this is an opportunity to, to, to provide you with more detail on that revenue stream, uh, particularly since the county is embarking on using it for the first time. Uh, specifically, I'll be referring to this as the uh, tax increment revenue, uh, which correlates, which, which relates to uh, uh, the TIF, the tax increment financing uh, law uh, in downtown Columbia, and how uh, this revenue stream supports uh, the development of downtown Columbia capital projects. First, I'd like uh, to define for you uh, what the sources of the incremental tax revenue in downtown Columbia are. Um, specifically for the county's purposes, uh, all revenue collected in the downtown Columbia Development District, which is defined by law, including uh, neighbor the, the Crescent neighborhoods, Lakefront neighborhoods, uh, Symphony Overlook neighborhood, and um, and buildings, um, Metropolitan and 10M Flats, which are two residential properties um, in prox uh, close proximity to the mall. Uh, this development district was established in 2016 with the passage of the tax increment financing uh, bill for downtown Columbia that enabled the county to issue TIF bonds to support public infrastructure development in downtown Columbia. Uh, these, uh, uh, this, this tax increment revenue, uh, the county projects, uh, we currently are doing a 30 year projection through fiscal year 2050. Um, and these revenue projections have recently been updated as of uh, spring 2020 to factor in post COVID uh, development assumptions and pattern changes in downtown Columbia. So uh, this slide before you indicates. Uh, so the previous slide indicated what the source of the what the source of the revenue is. Uh, this slide really lays out for you how that revenue can be expended, how the county can expend that revenue. So I'll I'll start with the left and and I'll move to the right. Uh, the first box uh, points out the incremental property tax revenues. That's the that's the, the revenues that have been collected. Uh, the first um, obligation of these revenues is to support uh, TIF bond, the 2017 TIF bonds that were issued um, in downtown Columbia and their associated administrative costs, as well as uh, a portion a. a general obligation debt service uh, commitments towards the elementary school, which is a portion of the funding for the elementary school. We refer to this phase or this, this portion of the, of the tax increment waterfall as the first available set aside. 
Um, once those two obligations are met, you then move to the third box, which is any offset of the special tax that is due. Um, as a definition, uh, special tax is defined as the amount of tax revenue that the developer in the development district must pay if incremental tax revenues are not sufficient to cover the costs of issuing the TIF bonds. Um, so uh, following the obligation to meet that offset, we then move to the, to the second available use of the tax increment revenue. And this is really what ties into the county's capital project, uh, county's capital project plans for downtown Columbia. So this particular portion of the revenue uh, uh, may be used uh, for debt service on downtown Columbia capital projects. Um, and this is, uh, this is articulated in the bond indenture with the investors um, who purchased the TIF bonds. Um, and one of the capital projects, um, I'm going to be going into more detail with you in this morning's presentation since it's relevant for the budget years that you're considering presently. And then uh, subsequent, um, if there is still remaining revenue after, uh, after it is used to support the county's current expenses for capital projects in downtown Columbia, any annual surplus may then be appropriated for any county purpose and move towards the general fund. So my next slide uh, now lays out for you those specific capital projects that the county is intended to use that quote unquote second set aside of tax increment revenue on and I'm listing them in chronological order. Uh, so uh, the first capital project, and, and, and I should also point out that these capital projects uh, were, were, are, are, are discussed in the Downtown Columbia Plan, which was passed in 2010. So these capital projects really originate from the plan concept uh, that, uh, that the county developed in conjunction with the community approximately 10 to 15 years ago. So this is really the implementation of that vision um, as, as context for all of you. So the first capital project, uh, which I will go into more detail about as the presentation unfolds, is the new cultural center. Uh, the county is based on our current, uh, our current fiscal projections and structure of the tax increment revenue. Um, uh, we are planning to appropriate 47.7 million of tax increment revenue towards this project beginning in fiscal year 22. Um, it's important to note, and I created a column, that a number of these capital projects also have, have, also have a residential component. Um, also in 2016, um, a modified affordable housing plan for downtown Columbia was also uh, passed into law. And one of those requirements is to uh, convert some of the public facilities in downtown Columbia to be mixed use, mixed income public facilities, which adds a nuance both in terms of how the projects are financed, how the projects are owned, um, and how the projects are, are approached, uh, all of which um, I will touch on and in using a, the new cultural center as an example. And in terms of the new cultural center status, there is a budget bill into the uh, county council right now referred to as TA01 uh, that would uh, transfer funding conditionally or placed in contingency in the FY21 CIP, uh, it would move it into its designated capital project in the CIP. I will, I will touch on the NCC though more as I continue. Let me just quickly run through the remaining capital projects that are envisioned to be uh, supported by this fund. The second is the new central library. Currently, uh, the county is, uh, is, uh, is utilizing a $40 million placeholder for this item. Uh, this, it, with an expected uh, 
start date for debt service payments of fiscal year 25. This project is also intended to have mixed income uh, residential units. Um, it's important to note for this project, since it is next in the queue uh, from the administration standpoint, the uh, planning funding uh, in an approximate amount of $500,000 has already been um, approved uh, by the County Council um, and is included in the FY21 CIP. We're currently working with the library system right now. Um, as you can see, you know, uh, our, and this, which was also the case for the new cultural center, the, the number that we're currently showing for the library um, does not uh, does not match the vision for the library that the county that the county and the library system shares. So we're going to be spending uh, the next several months with them, um, uh, doing our best to uh, update uh, update the estimates for the library to align with the vision, and then determine what types of modifications we'd have to make to our tax increment revenue schedule in order to accommodate that. Whether that be a delay. Um, or uh, or some other variables that we can change. Um, to kind of touch on that, you'll see the remaining capital projects, Banneker Fire Station, New Elementary School, Traffic Improvements and Transit Center. These are all uh, currently being assessed internally as well to determine any modifications to both the amount or the year. Um, the new with the new elementary school, we really rely on the school system CIP, and uh, the most recent uh, FY22 CIP request is reflected in the amount for the new elementary school that we're currently showing. So we suspect we expect to have a revised TIF revenue uh, forecast uh, available uh, when the FY22 budget uh, moves uh, moves to the county council. Uh, and you'll also see in my notes that we are working with the fire department, Department of Public Works, Office of Transportation on those updates uh, to their estimates. And we, uh, I also provided for you uh, estimated, estimated start years for the debt service payments um, and uh, the existence of a residential component. Uh, Banneker Fire Station and Transit Center, I'd like to highlight, are also projects that are, are intended to be uh, mixed use. So what I'd now like to do is, is, is touch on the new cultural center and give you some more detail on this project since it is currently included in, it is a part of the budget presently, and it is the first project in the queue for this revenue stream. Just a quick history, some of which I already touched on. Um, this was a public amenity that was envisioned in the downtown Columbia plan that passed in 2010. Uh, its purpose was to be the, a facility that served as the county's hub for visual and performing arts, which would be located in downtown Columbia. Uh, as I mentioned, the incorporation of residential to the project um, has resulted in a facility structure uh, th that, that I laid out before you. Uh, the Howard County Housing Commission uh, would own and operate the residential portion of the facility. Uh, Howard County government would own and operate the non-residential portion of the facility. The Department of Public Works would be the county's tenant and also leaseholder to the other, to the additional tenant in the building, which would be the Columbia Center for the Theatrical Arts, also known as CCTA. Just a brief background on CCTA. It's been a, a, an organization in Howard County for over 40 years, providing theatrical programming to children and youth in the community. It is intending to merge with Toby's Dinner Theater, which is a for-profit entity. Those two entities will be a non-profit entity um, serving as the hub for theatrical performing arts in the county and be that component of the NCC that was envisioned um, and would be occupying the facility alongside the Department of Recreation and Parks. How this project is intended to be financed, which is what's really relevant to this discussion and this presentation, um, are all designate or from the county administration standpoint, uh, we have all designate, we have identified designated funding sources to finance this project, which was the intention um, at the establishment of the fund. Uh, we believe no, there is no debt, debt service burden for issuing capital, capital bonds on the county general fund. Um, 
the three main the the main source of revenue to finance the bonds for the new cultural center um, will be supported by the tax increment revenue, which is the focus of this presentation. There's also a smaller portion of bonds that will be financed by uh, programming revenue that's generated by the Department of Recreation and Parks, as well as rental income that will be paid by CCTA. Um, I'm going to go into more some more detail on these bullets, uh, but uh, that is what the county that is what the county is projecting to be the revenue sources needed to finance the debt associated with building this public facility. Uh, this next slide is just intended to give you a quick snapshot of the programming that's in, that, that will occur from CCTA standpoint. Uh, there will be a 350 seat dinner theater uh, with commercial kitchen. This is really to mimic what is already exist in existence at Toby's Dinner Theater. The dinner theater is not going to change, uh, increase in size considerably. The kitchen will be able to be the kitchen will be modernized in that it will be a more diverse kitchen. So that uh, you know, Toby's Dinner Theater right now is just buffet style, but their intention is to convert to different types of uh, dining for experiences. Um, CCTA will also have a dedicated. Uh, black box theater, which it will use for its children's theater. Um, they have indicated a need and a, and a desire to have a dedicated space for children's theater programming in the county um, over for the last four decades. Uh, this will be the first opportunity that the county has uh, to provide children's theater, a children's theater, a dedicated children's theater space in the county, which CCTA will be programming. Uh, CCTA will also have a dance studio, various performing arts rooms, and will also manage the cafe and bar that's associated with the dinner theater or for any patrons who's coming in to use space. Uh, from the Department of Recreation and Parks' side, uh, they too will have a 300 seat uh, black box theater uh, to, and they will be doing various programming as well in that theater. There will also be a public art gallery that the Howard County Arts Council will be curating. Uh, they too have a dance studio and they have various arts rooms and studios for their classes. Reckon Parks' goal is to have, is to, is to focus on arts and culture uh, programming in this facility. They will offer some of their traditional services, tr traditional offerings that they do at other community centers, but their vision for their space um, is really to have a programming menu that focuses on arts and culture um, as defined by the community and its, and its strategic plan. Um, I just wanted to provide you some visuals. I know I've put a lot of words on the screen, but here are just some concepts of how the, how the facility is expected to look. Uh, the architect in this instance has provided us with some exterior drawings. Uh, the top one, Really, I can't recall which street view this is. This is, uh, but uh, you'll see kind of in the front left, that's the public terrace. Um, the, the, theater, the, the, the theater is below it where it says new cultural center and kind of to the right, as you move to the bottom right is where the gallery is, the open lobby and where you would kind of venture upstairs to the second floor and then uh, where, where additional rec and parks and CCPA classes and studios are. And then those top levels are all the residential. Um, I have some more detailed drawings for you. Here's what it might look like inside. The picture of the lobby, the picture of the outdoor atrium in the bottom left. Um, you'll see in this third image, you, you'll kind of get a configuration, like a sky level configuration. You'll see that Toby's Dinner Theater, which currently exists in the middle, um, uh, is going to kind of now the dinner theater is going to move to the left of the parcel parking garage is going to be in the north um, and that where Toby's theater is now is likely to be the big lobby the atrium the gallery uh, and 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 from a timing perspective the dinner theater will be constructed first um, the parking garage will be constructed second and as you can see in by phase two, the black box theaters are starting to build out. The visual and performing arts space is beginning to build out. Um, and phase three, phase two is 
uh, where we see the construction of the residential and the completion of the parking garage. So the residential is the final portion to be completed on this project. Um, I want to I want to give just a brief overview of how this project is being financed, what the overall costs are, and what those costs are associated with. That, that's what my next few slides will cover. Uh, the total project cost is approximately $131 million. This includes both public and private financing. Uh, this is a joint venture. This is very this is very unique for the county. So. Um, you know, we've spent a lot of time structuring this deal, both financially, programmatically, and, and, and legally, uh, in a way to uh, in a way to make it uh, financially sustainable um, and transparent. Uh, the non-residential portion of this project cost, which is the amount that the county is financing, is approximately 65.3 million, which also includes the county's portion of the parking garage. Howard County is requesting approximately $55 million in GEO bonds uh, of the 63, of the 65, I'm sorry. Um, of that 55, approximately 47.7 is supported by the tax increment revenue that I've gone through in this legislation. I mentioned prior that there's a smaller portion of bonds that are financed by Rec and Parks and CCTA, that's 7 million. Um, which is enumerated here uh, on this slide. There's also um, reserved uh, approximately $10 million in TIF bonds that the county council has already authorized um, and which the debt service is captured in our tax increment revenue schedule of $10 million, approximately $9.8 million to finance the parking garage. And then there is also included in the budget a $500,000 state grant, which has already been received from the Maryland State Arts Council, and a million dollar uh, personal donation. The residential portion of the facility, which is not included in the county budget and not a responsibility of the county, is roughly the same. It's approximately $65.2 million. It also includes their share of the parking garage, and it includes various sources of funds uh, tied to uh, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, which is a federal tax credit program to support the development of affordable housing that's managed uh, by the State Department of Housing and Community Development. They awarded this funding competitively to the Housing Commission. Uh, so these dollars are, are very precious to the county because they've been competitively bid by all the 20, by all 24 jurisdictions and was awarded for this particular project, which I think is an important point to make. Um, in terms of how the county is intending to spend its 65.3 million um, of, of the budget that was articulated in the prior slide, um, I'll point out to you the green portion of the costs or the county's responsibility. The red column or, or orange column is the Housing Commission's portion of the costs. So I'm going to focus on the county's portion of the costs, which is 65.3. How we broke it, I tried to break it out for you by the development phases. You'll see the main theater has a cost of approximately $29 million, which also includes the lobby, the gallery space, and a lot of the shared space. Um, I indicated the, the garage, the public portion of the garage has a cost of approximately 11. The visual and performing arts has a cost of approximately um, I want to point out, if I if I I want to point out the row titled land, um, the county is paying a portion of the land costs with the housing commission. So this would be an asset to the county. The land is valued at approximately four. The, the land we, the county will be paying four point three million dollars for this land. Just so you have a sense of how the transaction will transpire, Toby's Dinner Theater is going to sell their land, their property, or the Toby's General Partnership who owns that parcel, is going to sell that property to the Housing Commission in Howard County joint, or to, jointly, um, each paying their respective portion, each owning their respective portion. The, the ownership would be a condominiumized ownership structure, both for the facility and the garage, and the real estate documents will kind of enumerate this 
transaction, but that is the that is the framework of the real estate transaction uh, for this project, which I think is an important point for you all to to, to know. Uh, my next slide really kind of touches at the heart of this. So, what is the new cultural center's impact on the tax revenue schedule that the county has created? Um, I am extract. I've extracted on this slide two columns from that kind of more deep spread to show you the both the debt service payments for the NCC, which you see on that 47.7 million starting in FY22, concluding in FY41. The debt service payments are approximately $3.2 million per year. I also provided for you the annual available fund balance of the tax increment revenue, which it, from the county administration's vantage point, our goal was to maintain a positive fund balance um, every year during the duration of the NCC debt service payments. Uh, we believe we've been able to achieve that. Um, I'll show you before you that uh, our fund balance starts uh, in FY22. We're showing a $5.3 million fund balance. It, it, it goes down to, based on our projections, as low as approximately 700,000 in FY34. And then you'll see by FY41, and if based on the development pattern that we're predicting to occur in downtown Columbia, you'll really start to see uh, the revenue collections blossom in the mid to late fiscal year 30s when development, when the development pace uh, really, uh, really begins to, to escalate. Finally, just so you have a sense of where the new cultural center financing stands legislatively, um, as I indicated earlier, we initially filed uh, the NCC funding request in the FY21 CIP. Uh, we had put that project together. As I mentioned, this is a unique project, one the county hasn't done before. And so we really were, we really responded to the Housing Commission's receipt of the state's tax credit awards. And so we moved very quickly to complete that CIP request. So uh, FY21 was the first time that the council members um, and the community had seen the new cultural center as a capital budget item. So it was determined that uh, you know the funding be placed in contingency and that we spend more time to analyze it. Um, I will say one of the one of the critical elements that kind of prompted quick movement on this project from the county standpoint is that the state low income housing tax credit awards, particularly the competitive awards, have a deadline by which the building has to be completed. In this instance. The tax credits for this project require that the building be completed at the end of calendar year 24. So December 2024, the residential units have to be in use and occupancy. And since they're the since that's the last portion of the building that gets developed, we the county felt that we needed to move expeditiously on this project. Hence the decision to include it in the FY21 CIP. And then, you know, obviously honoring the county council's request to have more time to analyze it then spent uh, the summer and the fall kind of doing that additional analysis with them, providing additional analysis, kind of establishing a more refined framework for the financing. We, we, we found ourselves in a position to do that this past fall. So the county filed TA01 FY 2021, which is currently going before the county council. It's currently on the legislative table um, with, uh, with a goal of a January 2021 vote. So that means that if that were to occur, um, funding for the new cultural center would be approved in the FY21 CIP. And just my final important note, we're showing the first expense on the debt service to be fiscal year 22. At this point, we think by the time the you know funding is approved in January, by the time the parties got through closing, we would be into fiscal year 22 by the time we actually needed to make the first debt service expense. So that is this project, this revenue stream, this funding source in a nutshell. It also kind of gives you a, an update on kind of how things are looking in downtown Columbia, if that's of interest to you. And I'm happy to take any questions and thank you for your time. Thank you, Carl. Uh, sure, do you want me to, sure. Uh, and I'll keep my screen up just so uh, in case I need to go to a sl another slide, I'll be able to do that okay. for you.
a pretty quick for the downtown development. We have so many developments already. How much revenue does the county receive like per year, for example, last year and this year? So uh, downtown, and if you'll, if you'll just permit me a second, I have that in a spreadsheet, but um, I'd have to pull it up. We're collecting, uh, bear with me one second. Just find my, so uh, our, our model indicates that we're collecting, so, and we actually have some actuals too, so I can give you some actual years. So for example, in 2018, the county collected $2 million um, fiscal year in fiscal year 19, we collected 3.6 million. Fiscal year 20, uh, we we project to uh, or we, we collected 3.3. We're projecting 3.9 in fiscal year 21. I guess where I'm going with this is, you know, that number is going to steadily increase. You'll see it start to hit the 10 million dollar mark. Um, the annual collection of 10 million in about fiscal year 27. And then we're projecting the annual re revenue collections reach about 20 million in the early 2030s and, 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 and so on from there. So, so it's, it's incrementally going up year to year and then you're really gonna start to see increases about 10, 15 years from now based on our forecast. Thank you. I just wonder, is your model and your real number, do they match? Because if you, if you look at 2027, 20, 10 million, and 2030, three years later, you said $20 million. That's it. That's so, double So you're only seeing a portion of the spreadsheet in front of you. All, uh, and, and Holly, maybe it makes sense to provide them with the more detailed tax increment me, revenue spreadsheet. Uh, Carl, let me, let me just uh, talk about a concept. And also, we do have colleagues from 101 from finance department. They can chime in, and they can other feel free to add the information. Uh, one thing that uh, to clarify, I think Carl mentioned that early conceptually is that the revenue, the tax incremental revenue, meaning the additional property tax expected from the new development in downtown Columbia, that's the, the revenue side. On the expenditure side, there are multiple items. NCC is only one part of that. The primary purpose or number one is to use for the TIF, TIF bond, as well as also there's a one um, downtown Columbia um, um, elementary school down the road, I think elementary school 44 down the road. So the TIF bonds and, and that would, and that elementary school is the first one we need to take care of. And then they would be still net amount there. There's multiple other capital projects in downtown Columbia was intended to be self-sustainable by using those new development uh, generated property tax to take care of. So what Carl showed as project fund balance is after taking care of everything we just talked about, what's going to left. That's why you only see net amount somewhere between a couple million dollars uh, and in some years even less that until multiple years down the road because once we kind of paid off or most of the debt and then we were started to generate more revenue and also depend on development schedule but not all the new development is going to happen overnight so given time eventually there will be more and more revenue generated but debt service started to going down and we'll, we'll see more after like 10 to 15 years we, we really at that point started to get more net benefit by that time yeah and holly thank you for bringing that up chow if you just for context i put this slide back on the screen you know when you look at the projected fund balance column factor in the fact it's not just debt service for NCC, it's also tax revenues collected change every year, debt service on other projects start to come into play like the library, like Banneker. So there are various costs and revenues that feed into this annual debt, annual fund balance column. So asking the question, you know, how much revenue have we collected? That's one part of the formula. That's one part of the spreadsheet. So it's a good question. Thank you. Any other questions?
Okay, thank you all very much, and thank and uh, thank you, Carl, <laughs> for very uh, comprehensive presentation on this. Uh, so next, uh, I will invite our friends from library. I think Angela, you will be the presenter, right? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, please unmute yourself. Yeah, and then you can try to share uh, the PowerPoint on the screen. It's not letting me share yet. Wait, Clicking the share button. So, host, can you make sure uh, Angela is uh, the speaker and uh, she can share her file? Yes, she is. Okay. Hmm. Did you see the button in the bottom? There's a little one called uh, share content. All right, mine is grayed out. Um, it continues to be grayed out, so I apologize. We tried it earlier and it worked beautifully. Um, okay, um, for, this is Brooks for the technical folks. I think we have Angela Price as the presenter instead of Angela okay. Brooks. So we have to make that change. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hope everyone can see my screen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so while yeah. Angela gets set up there, I'll just uh, start and say good morning to you, Dr. Sun and committee members. I'm Tonya Akins, President and CEO of Howard County Library System. And presenting today, obviously, is Angela Brage, COO of Support Services. We thank you so very much for the opportunity to present preliminary information today on the Downtown Columbia Branch Project. That's by our customers as educational necessities and vibrant community hubs. Our libraries are places to learn, connect, and engage through notable author talks, community conversations, book discussions, classes for preschoolers, children, teen, and adults. And the new downtown Columbia branch is slated to be the largest in our system and will add to the thriving downtown scene. We eagerly anticipate the opportunities this new space will present not only for new Meriwether district residents, but for all the county. Angela is showing the slide with our mission and vision. Our mission is to deliver high quality public education for all. We do this with an intentional focus on equity and access. A vital piece of Howard County's renowned education system, we deliver excellence in education for everyone, advancing the economy and quality of life. Our strategic priorities include ensuring educational opportunities are innovative, accessible, and convenient for every person in our community. We do this by piloting innovative collections that meet our customers' needs and exceed their expectations increasing access and prevalence of self-directed and collaborative learning experiences, creating spaces specifically designed to enhance self-directed learning for children birth to five years of age and their caregivers, partnering with community organizations to address their library-based operational requirements and support their work to enrich learning in our community, and by leading strategic community engagement opportunities that enable us to reach new and underserved members of the community who may experience barriers to access. Next slide, please, Angela. Thank you. Howard County Library System remains the only five-star library system in Maryland. This designation is given by Library Journal using the LJ Index, which rates U.S. public libraries based on select per capita metrics. Star libraries are exemplars of superior service and community affinity. Approximately 6,000 libraries qualify annually to be rated, and we're proud that HCLS meets the requirements to be considered. It's worth noting that this designation is attained by fewer than 1% of all public libraries in the United States. And for perspective, there are more public libraries in the U.S. than there are McDonald's or Starbucks locations. So this is no small feat. We're grateful to enjoy the support of our community and the responsiveness to our services, which make this achievement possible. 
And I'm going to turn it over to Angela to just kind of give you some overview uh, of our system and then focus in on the downtown Columbia branch. Angela. Thank you, Tonya. HCLS has six community branches located throughout the county. Additionally, we have an administrative branch. The average age of our branches is 28 years, and we're appreciative of the investment in our from our community, the state, Department of Public Works, and the county. Has made in our capital projects through new construction and renovation projects over the past 58 years. Yes, Howard County Library System has been a mainstay in Howard County for that long. Our facilities not only house our show and showcase our nearly 1 million collection items, which includes the books, CDs, toys, AV, periodicals, and special collections, but also our facilities are home to the homework centers, the homeschool centers, early childhood learning centers and exploratory educational sites, teen hangouts and educational centers, community uh -huh. meeting spaces, test proctoring areas, DIY education centers and classrooms, our project literacy classrooms and tutoring spaces, as well as science and STEM classrooms. It's also has more than 400 public access computers and in support of art education, it houses our 500 item loanable collection, our business centers, historical repositories and spaces, our outdoor classrooms, several passport centers, and more. In addition to the key strategic focuses and achievements noted by Tonya, I would like to add that our role in the community, HCLS has guided our strategic, as guided by strategic initiatives that are established in response to the community needs and continue to expand based on the growing population and their needs, even during COVID. And it's all made possible because of our staff, the community, the stakeholder, and our facilities. As Tonya mentioned, this year in FY22, we continue to look towards the new library downtown. The library system project that is one that is forecasted is that of the relocation and construction of a new downtown branch. This branch will be a replacement for the current central branch, which is targeted for an alternative use in the downtown development. Additionally, the new, develop the new downtown building will address the anticipated residency projections and the new downtown area and meet the needs of that community. The new branch is also targeted to be larger than the existing central branch which is currently undersized and will res and resulting in a wait list currently, which is what we have. We have wait lists, we have service delays, and then we also have some unscheduled activities and events that we cannot schedule because of the lack of space. The new branch will enable HCLS to meet the per capita requirement by the state. I'd like to also mention that Central is the home of Project Literacy, which is a national leadership initiative that is designated as a model for other library systems. And that program is a highly successful adult basic education initiative, and it's made possible by the state of Maryland, as well as the Friends of Howard County and other foundations. The space challenge I mentioned is um, very interesting for Howard County, meaning that another, com another community benefit of the newly located branch will be the ability to adequately, adequately service our community, um, expand our classrooms, and enhance our educational programming. In 2019, um, Howard County Library System engaged a consultant to be part of our facilities master plan initiative to first examine the needs of the community related to HCLS's service and facilities also to forecast the needs of the future based on our community, state guidelines, and library practices across the country. Based on the rate of population growth over the years, our customers' requirements and expectations, as well as existing facilities and Maryland guidelines, HCLS has less than the minimum rec recommended level of square footage per, per capita. The new downtown is slated to increase the square footage and will eliminate at least some of the deficit 
and enable us to service our new community down there as well as others. The new downtown branch, I, I know that Carl mentioned it early in his presentation, this new downtown branch um, has been working over the past year. The development team and the stakeholders have worked together and the high level requirements for the housing and combined project with the library. The team's goal was to evaluate the requirements, the, state, the site considerations, as well as the cost of the building and the garage. The team determined, at least preliminarily, that the housing, the library component would be about 53 million and 13 million for the garage space with a total preliminary estimate of 68 million. The FY22 year will be for planning and analyzing the estimated request for FY22 is under review and will be available soon. HCLS is extremely mindful of the county's situation during the pandemic and the challenges it presents. So to that, we are engaged in discussions with the county and hope to get back to the script soon. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Angela and Tanya. Uh, any questions? Just a reminder, if anyone have questions, just unmute yourself. Thank you. Looks like Angela, you did a great job. There's no questions. <laughs> Tell <Great> you. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Tony. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, I really want to appreciate all the speakers, uh, guest speakers, spent time and did a very comprehensive uh, uh, overview for different important projects uh, for the county. Um, for the committee, um, next week, uh, we will continue our discussion on capital, um, actually, even more infrastructure <laughs> type of discussion. We'll have a, a transportation office talking about um, public transportation needs as well as complete streets. I know there are a lot of interest from the community on that. And there are also going to be discussion about storm water um, as well as uh, watershed and Elk City. These are also uh, both fundamental infrastructure needs of the county as well as some of the key projects going on. Um, and by the way, also I want to not forget to thank our IT department to provide continued support to hope making those virtual meetings more and more smoothly. Um, and thank all our committee members to get up there early <laughs> and to review and participate in the session. Thank you all very much. See you next week. <laughs>